figure out when he would be away. He kept very odd hours. Lately, Casanova was leaving them without any contact for longer and longer periods. He wasn't going to let them go. That was one of his lies. Naomi knew it was getting dangerous for all the women. Naomi sensed something desperate in the air. She could hear cries of alarm up ahead, and she tried to calm her own mounting fears and panic. She had lived in the projects of Washington. She'd seen horror before. Two of her friends had been murdered by the time she was sixteen. Then she heard him. His voice was strange and high-pitched. He was a madman. Come right in, ladies. Don't be shy. Don't stop in the doorway. Come in, come in, join the party, the swinging soiree. Casanova was yelling above the testosterone rock and roll that blared through the halls. Naomi closed her eyes for a brief moment. She tried to collect herself. I don't want to see this, whatever it is, but I have to. She finally entered the room. Her body began to shake. What she saw was worse than anything she remembered from the projects. She had to push her fist into her mouth to keep from screaming out. A long, slender body twirled in lazy circles from the ceiling beams. The woman was naked except for silver-blue stockings running up her long legs. A blue high-heeled shoe dangled from one foot. The other shoe had dropped to the floor and lay on its side. The girl's lips were already purplish-blue and her tongue protruded sideways from them. The eyes were stretched wide with terror and pain. It must be Anna, Naomi thought. A girl had been calling out for help. She'd broken the house rules. She said her name was Anna Miller. Poor Anna. Whoever you were before he kidnapped you. Casanova turned off the music and spoke calmly from behind his mask. He talked as if nothing much had happened. Her name is Anna Miller, and she did this to herself. Do you all understand what I'm saying? She was plodding through the walls, talking about escaping. There is no escape from here. Naomi shuddered. No, there is no escape from hell, she thought. She looked at green eyes and nodded her head. Yes, they had to take a chance, and soon. Chapter 77 the gentlemen stopped to play the game in Stoneman Lake, Arizona. It was a beautiful morning for it. It was crisp and cool, and the smell of a wood fire was in the air. He was parked in the woods among the boulders just off the rural road. No one could see him. He sat there and thought about the way they should go down as he watched a cozy, white-shingled family house through hooded lids. He could actually feel the beast taking over, the transformation the strange passion that accompanied it, Jekyll and Hyde. He saw a man leave the house and get into a silver Ford Aerostar. The husband seemed in a hurry, probably late for work. His wife was alone now, maybe still in bed. Her name was Juliet Montgomery. At a little past eight, he carried an empty gas container up to the house. If anybody happened to see him, no problem. He needed fuel for his rented car. No one saw him. Probably nobody around for miles. The gentleman climbed the front porch steps. He paused for a moment, then gently turned the doorknob. He found it amazing that people didn't lock their doors in Stillman Lake. God, he loved this, lived for it. His times as Mr. Hyde. Juliet was making breakfast for herself. He could hear her half humming, half singing as he made his way across the living room. The aroma and the crackling sound of bacon frying made him think of his family's house in Asheville. His father had been the original gentleman, army colonel, and proud and arrogant about it. Inflexible asshole who was never pleased about anything his son did. Big fan of the thick leather belt to instill discipline. Liked to scream at the top of his lungs as he beat the shit out of him. Raised the perfect son, high school standout scholar and athlete, Phi Beta Kappa undergrad, high honors in Duke Medical School, human monster. He watched Juliet Montgomery from the doorway that led into her spotlessly clean kitchen. The window shades were up and the room was flooded with sunlight. She was still singing an old Jimi Hendrix song called Castles Made of Sand. 
unexpected tune from the pretty lady. He loved watching her like this, when she thought she was alone. Singing something she'd probably be embarrassed to in front of him, carefully laying out her three strips of bacon on a paper towel that came close to matching the beige and brown kitchen wallpaper. Juliet wore a sheer white cottony negligee that fluttered around her thighs as she moved between the stove and table. She was in her mid-twenties, long dancer's legs, nicely tanned, bare feet on the kitchen linoleum, auburn hair she'd bothered to brush before coming down to make breakfast. A set of knives in a butcher block holder sat on the counter. He took out the cleaver. The knife made a soft ringing noise as it lightly struck a stainless steel pot on the counter. She turned at the sound. Very lovely in profile, freshly scrubbed, radiant. Juliet liked herself, too. He could tell that she did. Who are you? What are you doing in my house? The words came out in small gasps. Her face was as pale as a negligee. Now move fast, he told himself. He grabbed Juliet and held the cleaver up high. Shades of Hitchcock's Psycho and also Frenzy. High concept melodrama. Don't make me hurt you. It's all in your control, he said softly. She stopped the scream before it got out of her mouth, but the scream was in her eyes. He loved the look on Juliet's face, lived for it. I won't hurt you as long as you don't do anything to hurt me. Are we all right so far? Are we clear as a bell? She nodded her head curtly, a couple of nods. Her blue-green eyes were tilted up strangely. She was afraid to move her head too much for fear he'd slash her. She sighed. Amazing. She seemed to trust him a little. His voice had that effect on people. His style and fine manners, Mr. Hyde, the gentleman caller. She was looking deeply into his eyes, searching for some explanation. He had seen that questioning look so many times before. Why, it said. I'm going to take your panties off now. No doubt this has been done for you before, so there's no reason to panic. You have the softest, nicest skin. I mean that said the gentleman. The cleaver slashed quickly. I like you, Juliet. I really do. As much as I'm able to like anyone, the gentleman said in his softest voice. Chapter 78 Kate McTiernan was home again. Home again, home again, jiggity-jig. First thing she did was to call her sister Carol Ann, who lived far away in Maine now. Then she called a few close friends in Chapel Hill. She reassured them that she was perfectly all right. That was total bullshit, of course. She knew that she wasn't anything close to all right, but why cause them to worry? It wasn't Kate's way to inconvenience other people with her unsolvable problems. Alex didn't want her to go back to her house, but she had to. This was where she lived. She tried to calm herself a little, to slow down the big bad world in her head, at least. She drank wine and watched late-night TV. She hadn't done that in years, centuries. She was missing Alex Cross already, and more than she wanted to admit to herself. Staying home and watching TV was a good test, but she was failing miserably. She was such a schlump sometimes. She had developed, what, a schoolgirl crush on Alex? He was strong, smart, funny, kind. He loved children and was even in touch with a child in himself. He had a sculpted body, fabulous bone structure, a sensational torso also. Yes, she had a crush on Alex Cross. Understandable. Nice. Only maybe it was more than a crush. Kate wanted to call Alex at his hotel in Durham. She picked up the phone a couple of times. No. She wouldn't let herself do it. Nothing was going to happen between her and Alex Cross. She was an intern, and she wasn't getting any younger. He lived in Washington with his two children and his grandmother. Besides, they were too much alike, and it wouldn't work out. He was a willful black man. She was an extremely willful white woman. 
He was a homicide detective. But he was also sensitive and sexy and generous. She didn't care whether he was black, green, or purple. He made her laugh. He made her as happy as a clam in deep, wet sand. But nothing was going to happen between her and Alex. She would just sit here in her scary apartment, drink her cheap Pinot Noir, watch her bad, semi-romantic Hollywood movie, be afraid, be a little horny, let it get worse. That's what she would do, damn it. Build her character. She had to admit she was frightened to be in her own house, though. She hated that feeling. She wanted all of this shitty madness to stop, but it wouldn't. Not even close. There were still two horrifying monsters on the loose out there. She kept hearing creepy noises all around her in the house. Old creaking wood, banging shutters. Wind chimes she had put on an old elm tree outside. The chimes reminded her of the cabin in Big Sur. They had to come down tomorrow, if not sooner. Kate finally fell asleep with the wine glass, which was really an old Flintstones jelly glass, balanced in her lap. The glass was a holy relic from the house in West Virginia. She and her sisters used to fight over it sometimes at breakfast. The glass tipped and spilled onto her bed covers. It didn't matter. Kate was dead to the world, for one night at least. She didn't usually drink much. The Pinot Noir hit her like the freight trains that used to rumble through Birch when she was a kid. She woke at 3 a.m. with a throbbing headache and hurried into her bathroom where she got sick. Images of Psycho flashed through her mind as she bent over the sink. She thought of Casanova in the house again. He was in the bathroom, wasn't he? No. Of course no one was there. Please make this stop. Make this end. Right. Now. She went back to bed and crawled under the covers. She heard the wind rattling the shutters. Heard those stupid chimes. She thought about death... Her mother, Suzanne, Marjorie, Kristen, all gone now. Kate McTiernan pulled the blanket over her head. She felt like a little girl again, afraid of the bogeyman. Okay, she could handle that. Trouble was, she could see Casanova and the horrifying death mask whenever she closed her eyes. She held a secret thought buried in the center of her chest. He was coming for her again, wasn't he? At seven in the morning, her phone rang. It was Alex. Kate, I was in his house, he said. Chapter 79 Around ten, the night we returned from California, I drove to the Hope Valley residential area of Durham. I went alone to see Casanova. Dr. Detective Cross was back in the saddle again. There were three clues that I considered essential to solving the case. I reviewed them again as I drove. There was the simple fact that they both committed perfect crimes. There was the aspect of twinning, the codependence of Casanova and the gentleman. There was the mystery of the disappearing house. Something had to come from one or all of those bits of information. Maybe something was about to happen in the Hope Valley suburb of Durham. I hope so. I drove slowly along Old Chapel Hill Road until I reached a formal white brick portal-type entrance into the upscale Hope Valley Estates. I got the feeling that I wasn't supposed to intrude beyond the gate, that just maybe I was the first black man, not in working man's overalls, to pass through here. I knew I was taking a chance, but I had to see where Dr. Wick Sachs lived. I needed to feel things about him, needed to know him better and in a big hurry. The streets of Hope Valley didn't run in straight lines. The road I was on didn't have curbs or gutters, and there were not many street lamps. The neighborhood was unpleasantly hilly, and as I drove I began to have the sense of being lost, of moving in a great, looping circle. The houses were mostly upscale southern gothic, old and expensive. The notion of the killer next door had never been more powerful." Dr. Wick Sachs lived in a stately red brick house set back on one of the highest hills. The shutters were painted white, matching the gutters. The house looked too expensive for a university professor, even one at Duke, the Harvard of the South. The windows were all dark and looked as shiny as slate. 
The only lights came from a single brass carry.